Hi everyone, my name is Heather Jackson. I'm the co-founder of Unlimited Sciences and the founder and board president of the Realm of Caring Foundation. And for those of you not familiar with our organization, we are a psychedelic research nonprofit and we're combining the power of data and lived experiences to serve our community. We educate the public, we inform common sense practices and policies as well. I'm so excited about a project that we've been collaborating with Johns Hopkins University on developing a really, I think, very exciting psychedelic study um, using psilocybin. And so we're going to have more information on that really soon. My understanding is they're in the last stages of the logics and testing. So we'll have that to announce uh, very shortly for you. Um, and you can learn more about Unlimited Sciences on our website, unlimitedsciences.org. Um, also, if you wanna help support our work, um, we of course are a nonprofit. I like to say we're a four impact organization. And so please consider donating to Unlimited Sciences if you're able to um, on our website, unlimitedsciences.org slash donate. Um, and your contributions are, they're vital in allowing us to continue this great work and to learn more from the experiences that people are having using psychedelics in the real world setting, uh, how we can reduce harm, uh, show positive outcomes, potentially, especially including health outcomes. Um, and then there's a lot of cool gifts for you in return for your contribution. So thanks for that. And our sponsor today is Maya Health. And I want to thank Maya Health for contributing to this uh, education today. And Maya helps psychedelic practitioners to lead more effectively, to ease their workload and to serve more people. So thanks Maya for supporting this episode of Unlimited Sciences. Okay, and now without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce our guest today. This is Gunther Weil, PhD. He was one of the core graduate student members of the Harvard Psilocybin Project um, from 1960 to 1963 that we're all um, familiar with. He was working closely with Timothy Leary, Ralph Metzner, and also Richard Alpert, who you might know as Ram Das. Uh, Gunther is the founder and CEO of Value Mentors. He is an internationally recognized organizational consultant, an executive coach, family advisor, and educator who has for many years provided guidance and coaching to executives and their organizations in the areas of value-based leadership, innovation, team building, strategic planning, and executive wellness. His clients have included numerous public and private sector institutions in the United States and in Europe. Dr. Weil served for 10 years as the CEO of Intermedia Recording Corporation and Senior Vice President of Intermedia Systems Corporation, a publicly held media production and consulting firm. He received his doctorate from Harvard University in 1965, was a Fulbright Scholar in Europe, and was subsequently actually recruited by Abraham Maslow as well to teach at Brandeis University. And so on this edition of Unlimited Voices, um, we're going to be discussing with Gunther uh, the pioneering psychedelic research that he did, his friendships with the legendary psychologist, author, spiritual teacher Ram Das and death and dying as it replaces, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna start that section over. Um, on this edition of Unlimited Voices, we're going to discuss Gunther's pioneering psychedelic research, his friendship with the legendary psychologist, Arthur, and spiritual teacher, Ram Das. And we're gonna discuss death and dying as it relates to psychedelic experiences, but also just as it relates to us here. And uh, I have a great interest in that. So Gunther, Yay, I've been so much looking forward to this over the last couple of weeks um, as we've been preparing. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, well, I want to dive right in. Thanks for um, sitting through the lengthy introductions as we got through all the housekeeping. Um, we did open up to questions to our um, fan base, and, and so we've got some questions from them and, and some from from the team as well. So I'd love to hear about uh, your early education. And one of the questions from our audience was, it's kind of, I guess they're wondering how you came to wanting to study psychedelics. Was it a personal experience or just, uh, you know, sheer curiosity? So your education and how did you come to this work? 
Well, the, uh, I think the, uh, one of the early motivations uh, when I was in late adolescence and early 20s, uh, and even maybe earlier, was that I, I had a, uh, a deep love of, of, of jazz and, uh, and the culture, the subculture of jazz early on, I'm talking about in the, you know, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, having spent a year in, uh, in Europe, uh, well, a lot of time in Paris, I was able to hang out with a, a number of, of expatriate jazz musicians and, uh, and other artists. And so I was exposed to, to uh, cannabis early on in my life. Uh, and uh, not, not many uh, people my age or white people for that matter in our culture at that time had any exposure to that. This was a time when uh, under the, uh, the czar, the narcotic czar, Henry, or Harry Anslinger, I think was his name, where yes. you, may, you may remember that or know yep. that. Yeah, the history. Where, sure. where the cannabis, you know, and was, was viewed as a... Uh, as a gateway to uh, heroin and all uh -huh. kinds of stuff. So, the devil's lettuce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fact, yeah. Uh, I think you can find on YouTube some of the, uh, the an early film that was a propaganda film that was created by Anslinger and his team. So anyway, I was yeah. exposed to, to the subculture through jazz as subculture. I was exposed to, uh, to cannabis and I had mind altering experiences early on. Uh, and then the more immediate uh, factor was when I began my graduate school, my, my advisor was Tim Leary. And uh, so I, I had a meeting with him uh, in the uh, late summer, beginning the fall semester at Harvard in 1960. Uh, right. Uh, and uh, in the course of that meeting, he, he shared with me his experiences the summer before in, in Mexico and that he had shifted his interest completely into the area of psychedelics. And if that's something that I was interested in, he'd be happy to be my advisor. Since the, normally the policy is that students are kind of arbitrarily assigned to faculty and then they can move around once they, they have an initial meeting to see if right. they- Right, okay. So I said, sign me up, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> within, within a week or two, I had my first psilocybin experience. So with, within a week or two, you had another meeting <laughs> oh wow okay so, you know that we were off and running at that point right okay so that that's really what piqued your interest into wanting to do this in your in your graduate work and and helping with the research that he was did he already have research underway or that was still it was just beginning to mobilize you know yeah. the team together of graduate students uh it was still early in the relationship between uh Richard Alpert or Ram, I'll refer to him as Ram Das from now point. Perfect. Okay. Uh, but things were just needed to mobilize. I met Ralph Metzner, a couple other people, uh, George Litwin. And, and so I was one of the core graduate students. It was Ralph, George, myself, and then uh, Tim and Ram Das. We were the five core people. And there were, there were a number of other people a little bit more on the periphery, but I think the five of us were basically. Uh, the core of that group that took things forward. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I have a surprise for you. So I, I was looking for some of some early work and this is this book, which is first edition. And by the way, bravo on the cover, there's like this little plastic thing that makes it a little like a little bit visual. And this is this book is uh, the psychedelic reader. And this was these were um, articles or papers, I guess you would suggest, uh, what would you call them uh, from the Psychedelic Review? Yes, it was a compilation of, the, of what we consider to be the most representative and best articles of the review. I, uh, at one point for a couple of years, I, I was one of the editors, co-editor and then editor of the review. Uh, yeah, this is brilliant. Um, I, I really want to make sure that we asked some questions about, you know, the early learnings and so that we don't forget some of those uh, things that you've learned. But this, uh, I love this. It says, you have before you a book that answers a demand. These are your words, by the way. 
perhaps your own, for more information, advice, and illumination in the scientific religious foreground of consciousness expansion. A constructive and productive dialogue needs intelligent and knowledgeable individuals. When the dialogue reaches the level of practical social innovation, the wider dissemination of the theory and data becomes an obligation. And boy, I, do I feel like we, we're here still now, right? I mean, it's- a uh, I actually haven't read those words in years and it, they seem like it could have been written uh, this morning, you know? I, I know, I know. So, um, and I'm so thankful to be having intelligent dialogue about the topic. And so tell me, I mean, a, what a lot of people have heard about was, you know, the prison project. And were you involved in that? And what, what was that? What did that look like? Yeah, I was deeply involved. Uh, there were three of us involved in that. Uh, Tim, of course, uh, Ralph Metzler and myself. We were the three, I think, major players in that. In that. So that began, uh, again, it was one of our first projects when after a number of experiences and readings and, and also looking at some of the literature of, of AA uh, and the founder of AA, I forgot his name, Bill, read his last name, had also actually had taken LSD and had been uh, was one of the very, one of the factors that, that prompted him to not to form AA, but but to to reiterate for him to reemphasize or, or in some way uh, the the importance of of internal transformation, you know, inner transformation. Right. So so we began that project uh, negotiating with the, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health and and whatever the in the criminal justice department and, and the Bureau of Prisons, I, I've forgotten the details of, you know, what the bureaucracy yeah. was at that time. And, and we came in under a, a normal rubric at that time, which was that, that uh, for better or for worse, and often for worse, if prisoners volunteered for pharmaceutical experiments in early trials, early, early human trials of a variety of different drugs, uh, including you know, all kinds of drugs, but certainly not, not, uh, you know, not psychedelics, uh, they would get what was called good time. They would get time off their sentence. Okay, if they so, participated in either pharma research, uh, mostly pharma research, it sounds yes, like, yes. they get time off their sentence, okay. And, and obviously there was an attendant risk to that research, right. given the nature of, of these early trials. Uh, I don't know if that's even being done anymore in prisons, but anyway, our hypothesis was that through a, a deep transformational experience using psilocybin with appropriate support and so on, that, that we could help to reduce the recidivism rate uh, of, of prisoners, which at that time was about 72, 73%. I don't think it's changed very much actually over the years, over, over the history yeah. of the criminal justice system. I think the recidivism rate has pretty much remained the same. So that was our hypothesis, and we negotiated that with the relevant authorities. And they didn't know from beams about psychedelics versus antibiotics, what have you. Right. And we were Harvard University, so we had a certain primitive, if you will, certain status. So uh, we were able to negotiate that. And before long, we found ourselves uh, one morning, early in the morning, uh, in, in Concord Prison which was a kind of, you know, I think it was over a hundred years old back in the yeah. 60s. It was like some kind of like Gothic image, you know, out of a French sure. movie. <laughs> and we were in the back ward of the hospital wing of the uh, prison uh, administering uh, psilocybin and placebos to uh, a group of generally 10 to 12 prisoners. And, and these were prisoners that were selected uh, first of all, they, they were vol they volunteered, and then we were able to select them based on on the fact that they they had a release date, actually. Oh, so okay. That, that was important that that within a year or so there would be a release date that they would they would be uh, available to, for parole. Okay. So, and they they ranged in age and in type of offense and in ethnicity and race and so on. It was a good sample. Yeah. And we began that way. So 
every uh, two weeks, we would go to uh, Concord Prison and uh, we would, uh, on, on one visit, we would say administer psilocybin early in the morning. The, we, got, we got our psilocybin directly from Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland through communication with, with Albert Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And again, these were <clears throat> synthetic psilocybin, right? Or psilocybin is actually the word for the synthetic component. And, uh, and we began. And then uh, the second visit, again, it was twice a month, we would go in for a few hours to debrief what we had done in the, in, in the, uh, the actual session, the psilocybin session. So essentially once a month we were there administering psilocybin to this group. And what did the, what did the administration look like? Um, were, so you, you were just in a room, how, what, how, what was the procedure? How did you administer it? Well, that's a good question because, you know, uh, it's a prison, pretty yeah. stuck. I was just thinking like set and setting here. <laughs> I mean, there's no really place to like, obviously that's where you have to do it, but. <laughs> well, you know, we, we did a site visit first and, and kind of, you know, figured out what we were dealing with. Yeah. So we brought in, uh, you know, Indian, you know, uh, prints actually, Indian prints, right? We actually brought in some sticks of incense. Uh, okay. Well, the incense didn't fly. They they tolerated the Indian prints, but they didn't like the incense, so we had to we had to stop that. But okay. we did what we could to you know to impact set and setting. Yeah. Uh, given the nature of the circumstances, you know. Uh, right. Provide a comfortable environment as, as comfortable an environment as you could. Yeah, and and a major part of that was how we showed up. Yeah. Right. Psychologically, speaking psychologically and, and relationally, how, right. how, how do we show up? So we didn't show up in, in white coats with stethoscopes. Uh, we, you know, we were in, in academic tweed jackets and, right. uh, and loafers. And, but, but most of all, we, we were there uh, uh, humble, curious, interested, open. And, uh, you know, Tim had formulated a for a year or so before he was in the press of formulating a model of psychotherapy, which uh, was based on a kind of game theory model he had developed, which the effort was to attempt to reduce the power disparity between the therapist and the client. Oh, okay. He came in with a, a, a set, if you will, a psychological set of, of working with these folks uh, in a way that was very different than the typical client-patient relationship. Uh, and of course, of ha having had a number of experiences already with psilocybin specifically, uh, you know, we were primed for that. We were primed for working with these folks as, as human beings who had a different karma, had a different, you know, a, a different set of conditions in their life. Uh, we were the, you know, the Harvard profs, so to speak. And they were, uh, you know, a handful of people from different walks of life who had one way or another, it ended up in, uh, in with a criminal identity. Uh, yeah, time, so. and then you followed them after they were released, and did they have a lower recidivism rate? We didn't impact that rate much. Uh, that's a whole other story, uh, because what one of the things we realized late in the game, and you know, as 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 they began to release, and we did this for a couple of years, and a year and a half or so on. I don't remember exactly. And then people were re released, so our sample size diminished. Yeah. And when we began to, we stayed in touch with them. I have a number of stories around that, but we stayed in touch with them and we realized that, that it was not enough to create a transformational experience. Truly transformational, but what was needed was some form of ongoing support and reinforcement, a la AA, for example. Yes. So, okay. So what we might refer to as, you know, like integration now that yes. needed to have some additional support after the big event, if you yeah. will. And yeah. we, and I think we even used that word integration. So what we did was we actually got in touch with a, 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 a AA inspired group called Synanon, which had worked in prisons and had been, had focused on, on drug addiction. 
And it was started by a guy named Chuck Diederich, uh, who had also had psychedelic experiences. And uh, so we, we began working with Chuck and his people to design a program that could provide the ongoing AA type or Sendinon like support for people. Okay. But frankly, Heather, we were so ahead of our time. I mean, yeah. well, we were so far out in terms of the timeline of, of what we were doing. I'm, the, the, the best of my knowledge, that experiment hasn't been repeated to this day. You know? uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to find, and we can, in, and we'll include it um, in the show notes. So I was speaking with a researcher who I, I don't believe they're doing this sort of the in-prison experimentation with pharmaceuticals or drugs and, and psychedelics, uh, uh, definitely not um, anymore. But he was talking about how they were doing a large survey work. So I'll make sure that we add this in which they looked at psychedelic use um, prior, if they had used psychedelics prior and did they have a lower recidivism rate and they did it was actually pretty significant so not that they took psychedelics in prison but that those who used psychedelics did they were less likely to end up back in prison um, and I would just just speaking to him um, recently about our our general registry that we're trying to get launched was uh, an area of interest for for him so I'll be sure to, yes. to information well, about it. Let me address that because it, that, that's interesting finding the first I've heard of that. Uh, you know, from a, a research perspective, uh, as you know, you know, it's kind of a basic axiom that correlation is not causation, right? So, right. and maybe multivariate factors at play. Someone who's had a psychedelic experience may also have adopted a slightly different lifestyle, maybe different nutrition maybe their relational skills were already a little bit different. Maybe, right. they, maybe they maintained a connection to their immediate family. I don't know. Right. But Yeah, I know they did control, control, but I don't know what all they controlled for. But yeah, yeah I think that's, that is, that's really interesting. And what other, so what other research, um, well, I, I have a question back to what you said. You said you had some good stories about staying in touch with the participants in that study. Tell, tell me one of them. Um, one story of one of your participants in your, in your follow-ups, how, what, how did it affect them? You know, did it uh, change them so significantly? Were they thankful um, for that experience? Did they have to be naive, uh, you know, like uh, psychedelic naive before they were allowed in? So uh, no, I mean, uh, okay. you know, uh, it could have had a previous psychedelic experience. Yeah, it's not likely because the psychedelics just were not known. Yeah. Know? I'm not talking, uh, you know, in, in 1961. Okay. So, I mean, outside of yeah. the circles mm -hmm. of, you know, of the West coast and, and, and certain artistic circles, you know, in other places. And, and, and of course what we were doing at Harvard it itself was not that well known came known yeah. very quickly. But a couple of stories. Well, one individual in particular was a younger man uh, who benefited greatly from the work uh, we did. Uh, and he, he went on uh, to uh, be uh, in a career as a videographer. Uh, he, uh, he moved to Maine and, and then uh, has led a very successful life as a, as a videographer and as a uh, coach also to other prisoners and, and, and did a number of projects relating to environmentalism and other things. So that was a success story. But he was yeah. young and had, had not yet been like, I say, uh, hadn't, been, hadn't had a history of lifelong criminality or multiple imprisonments. You know? So, right. so yeah. that's, that's a variable there too. Uh, another story which is quite interesting was one of our Participants was a uh, Irish mafioso who uh, okay. he and his brother uh, were, were in prison most of their lives from the time they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. And uh, his brother was actually in, in a Walpole prison in Massachusetts, which was a maximum, well, Concord was a maximum security also. Walpole was a newer prison at that time, which was even more so. 
And uh, he was actually on death row because they were, they were still executing at that time. So our client, my client, so to speak, at that time, uh, he, uh, we had a number of interesting experiences that during one of our sessions, for example, uh, at Concord, uh, he had taken, uh, not the placebo, he had actually taken psilocybin. Uh, we had cots, by the way, you know, hospital cots around the room, as I mentioned earlier, some Indian prints. And so I was sitting on, on, a, on a chair, a stool, or on the edge of the bed next to him. Uh, he was pretty much like a mobile, like almost catatonic uh, during the course of the session early on. And so I had some concerns. He was clearly having a bad trip. Uh, so I was doing my best, using my best therapeutic skills and basic humanity to try to help him. And he just wouldn't respond. So it, we went, sat, we were out doing that, that for hours, actually, you know, repeated, repeatedly, I tried to help him and nothing shifted. So two weeks later, we came back to do a debrief. At that point, he was actually, you know, lucid and, and okay. So as I inquired with him at what had been going on, he said to me that he, he got into a, a paranoid, he, he went into a paranoia that we were administering a, a, a truth serum, that, th that the whole thing was a ploy, was a conspiracy to, uh, to use uh, the, the psilocybin as a way of extracting from him uh, crimes that he had committed that he hadn't been busted for. Right. <laughs> so, so he's like, yeah, I was just trying to. <laughs> I'm so I'm doing that. my best. I'm, yeah, I'm a, you know, 25 year old graduate student and yeah. basically his late middle 40s, spent most of his life in jail, who, you know, was, as I say, a, a checkered career in, in many different ways. Right. Um, and, and a real tough guy. I mean, a real tough Irish hitman, you know. So he was planning to have me killed. He, he shared that with me in the, uh, in the in dialogue. Uh, and oh, we were both kind of laughing about it, you know, because it was so bizarre. It was so out there that, that he would even fall into that kind of ideation and get trapped there. Yeah. And, and so we, we had a chuckle about it because he came out of it, you know. Yeah. Like, and then after that, were you like, Tim, okay, what other projects can we do? Because I'm trying to keep here. I'm not trying to get taken out at some point here. <laughs> Did you guys have other projects that you worked on? I mean, that's a really famous one, but. Well, then fast forward, uh, you know, some years later, a couple, a few years later, I got a call one afternoon in my office. I was teaching at, at, at that point at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, campus had opened the year before. I got a call from him and oh. he, uh, it was late in the afternoon. He said, Gunther, I'm, I'm out. I'm on parole. I can, I'd like to come in and chat with you. And I said, sure. So he came over. I stayed longer. He came over in the early evening and we chatted and, and he said to me, uh, I want you to know that, that I'm, I'm out. I, I violated my parole. I'm actually on the lamb again and I'm going to be leaving Massachusetts and you'll never see me again, but I wanted to tell you how important the work we did together oh. was. He said, I, he said, I've never committed, since that time, I've never committed a violent crime. Okay. Wow. He had committed crimes, okay, but not, not, a, not violent crimes. Yeah. But, but he said, I'm a criminal. He said, my whole life, I've been kind of, these are my words, not his, but essentially he was saying, I'm paraphrasing, I, I was trained to do this, basically. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. was teaching and trained to do this, and and so, but you you guys and the work you did provided a way for me to have some. Again, these are my words. I don't remember exact words, but it was, yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was so warm and so heartful and so human, and we hugged and he left. And I, as true to his word, I never heard from him again. But yeah, he felt it's so important to kind of close the loop with me. On, in terms of what had happened to him as yeah. a human being in, in the work that we did. So. Wow, thank you for sharing that. I, I think that that is, in my experience, often the case. You know, people are just so thankful uh, for the experience. Of course, 
sometimes there are challenges as as you described but often you know it's it's one of those questions too about you, you know i've heard roland griffiths talk about this as far as like is it really a bad trip or you know is it challenging and it also gives us some sort of insight and later you realize the insight and sometimes it absolutely figure that out yeah i mean but it, it it's critical there that how how that experience is processed and framed uh so that it can be understood and utilized in a in a way that's therapeutic yeah uh so and many many times people will have bad trips and and they don't have the opportunity to to be supported in the processing i know a right. number of people from that period who who just freaked out and and never again experimented they were like totally resistant because yeah they had such a bad experience so yeah definitely don't want to have that again and so they just stay off the whole thing yeah. any other research that you did that that you think is important to talk about any other yeah. The other project, of course, was uh, the notable other project was the uh, Good Friday experiment. Okay, yes. Conflict. That was conducted by one of our colleagues. Uh, his name was, was Walter Pankey. He was a uh, psychiatrist, MD, who had also uh, had been, was, I believe, at the time, a or had graduated from the Harvard Divinity School. So he was an interesting combination of being uh, trained as a Episcopalian pastor, a priest, and, and an MD, and had been a student of mysticism and so on. So he approached us with an idea to conduct an experiment on Good Friday. And we worked with a number of people from the Andover Theological Seminary and DU and so on. And that, of course, that experiment is, you know, is, is part of history on Good Friday. On a Good Friday, we, we, we had a, about a dozen or so uh, theology students from Andover Newton Theological Seminary. And we held it at the uh, Marsh Chapel, the yeah. chapel in Boston at, on the BU campus. And half the group got placebo, half got psilocybin. And, uh, and we conducted a, uh, a, uh, a ritual, a Good Friday, service basically mm -hmm. which a number of people experienced like real i would say you know christian mysticism right? the christian version of, of mysticism including stuff that you find in you know in some of the classic catholic and christian lit literature of, of the christian mystics so. wow so what in your mind were some of the important discoveries you know, of that time, you know, for example, I, 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 you and I have a relationship. So you've done um, some coaching actually for, for me personally, uh, some of the value mentoring and also for my older son. So I, I had the pleasure of speaking with you many, many times over. And, you know, I heard you um, mention something about the, you know, we talk about set and setting quite a bit um, in psychedelics. And, and you had mentioned something that I didn't know, um, that, that like, your early work sort of established that, but you were talking about how it was maybe a repurposing of the sort of in, indigenous culture with set and setting. So t talk to me a little bit more about that and then any other sure. discoveries that, that came from that time. Well, again, early on, uh, we realized how important set and setting words, set defined as the psychological expectations and assumptions that you had coming into the experience, how you were framing it psychologically, if you will. And the setting is the physical setting, the people, the environment, the aesthetics, uh, including the, and very important here, the sensory dimensions of the experience, the visuals, the smells, the sights, the sounds, and so on. Those are all critical. And as we were you know, as we were initially experimenting with psilocybin and, and had some very profound experiences, we, we, we became motivated to look at, at what, a, what other cultures had done over centuries, going back to the, to the, uh, the Greek mysteries, uh, 
to shamanistic traditions in Central and South America and other places in Africa. You know, and we read widely, and, and some of that literature is in the psychedelic, was in the psychedelic review and in the book you showed earlier. So we realized how important set and setting was. Right. So it was Tim that actually formulated those words, set and setting, I believe. Okay. Uh, and, and so he gave form to an understanding that was characteristic of, of all the traditional indigenous uses and applications where the context is extremely important and the set and setting are, are critical. Right. And usually these were done in a ritualistic fashion as part of the, of the tribe, part of the religion, part of the framework, the, their metaphysics, if you will, their worldview. So we realized that we had to do something similar. So when I use the phrase repurposing, is that's exactly what we did. But Tim came up with the term, and then we, we began to much more consciously craft how we would arrange the set and setting. Yeah. How to prepare people for the experience, and how we'd arrange the physical setting to maximize the potential for transformation. Right, we which is still this. used today in the, in the chemical research that we use today. It's exactly yeah. what they so, do, yeah. In, in, in contrast, for example, when we were experimenting, there was other work going on uh, with psychedelics in the Boston area, which is where we were based. Uh, there was a group of psychiatrists led by a, a researcher named Max Rinkel, who was a, a German psychiatrist, who it turned out later was very likely on the payroll of the CIA doing experiments with mind control uh, with psychedelics. Uh, to see if they could be utilized in some form of chemical warfare, if you will. You know, psychic wow. So, I, so I've heard that, but I wondered, you just disclosed what we call the T. <laughs> A little bit of drama there. That's really, yeah. what, okay. So, so this was, you know, legitimate, so to speak, within sure. the framework of their worldview work uh, done to see if, if psychedelics could be used to create psychosis. So wow. the phrase that was used at that time was psychotomimetic, psychotomimetic, psychosis mimicking. Okay. okay. So their belief, their assumption was that these drugs were a subset of, of, of you know, of, uh, of drugs that could be used to create psychosis and therefore could be used to immobilize populations or troops or what have you. Right. So, uh, they were, so for example, the set and setting they were operating with, uh, and I remember meeting with, with, with Max, you know, and being kind of amazed and dismayed by, by what they were doing. Uh, I didn't know any better. I mean, they, they were operating within, you know, the framework of their own conditioning. And uh, so, you know, their, their volunteers would come into a room with white walls and stethoscopes and white coats and machines humming and fluorescent lighting. And they yeah. would lay on a bed and they would be administered an IV with, you know, with psilocybin or what have you. And they would have psychotic experiences. Duh. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> it felt alienated and depersonalized and fearful and paranoid. Yeah. And the whole set and setting was designed to create that. Was yeah, and yet and yet those principles were these researchers Wrinkle and his they were oblivious to that, oblivious to what was so obvious to us, right? Given, right. given how we are, were approaching it, you know. So two distinct uh, ways that were being operated, projects that were being operated at that time. One sure. for betterment, and one to literally try to cause harm to see if they could weaponize that potentially. So when I, when I, what delights me about the work that's been going on now in quite a few years in John Hopkins and in Israel and, and some other places is that set and setting is, is kind of baked in now, right? So, yes, yeah. you know, that's a given. So Yeah, uh, it definitely is. So that definitely came out of that time frame. Any other, um, you know, important discoveries from that time frame? Well, it, I, the, the fundamental epiphany was how powerful these agents were. Uh, initially with psilocybin, 
and then uh, through a whole other set of circumstances with LSD, uh, which was, you know, one was a, uh, I would say, uh, I hate to use this terminology, but it's the one that comes to mind. One was a nuclear bomb, the other was a hydrogen bomb, okay? Mm. So, <laughs> so, again, that's not the most apt terminology, but but in terms of particularly of what's been described and what we saw early on uh, as, as the kind of diminishing or death of the ego, uh, diminishing or, 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 or death of the, of the sense of, of the little me, the little egoic me trapped in, in, in a body of skin, uh, the uh, LSD, which was was much more powerful in terms of creating that kind of experience. Uh, our experience, even with larger doses of, of psilocybin, was that it fairly much, it, it loosened the ego structure and it had a tremendous psychological and, and, and spiritual dimension and aesthetic dimension, sensory dimension. But LSD, uh, was was really of a different order of magnitude in terms of, of kind of breakthrough stuff. Okay. So, so we began to explore that too. And the history of that, uh, you know, was that was a whole other story connected with how that came on the scene. So, so then at one point that that team was sort of disbanded. They were fired, right? And that that team stopped um, conducting research. Well, it was a, a matter of attrition. Uh, first of all, Richard Aramdas was fired uh, because he had violated an agreement he had had with the Harvard administration to not give uh, psilocybin to undergraduates. We, we had an agreement. Uh, he had a relationship with an undergraduate who was very interested, who happened to be the son of one of the board of directors or the board of overseers of Harvard, a very wealthy, very influential uh, individual businessman in New York. And when his father got wind of what happened, he went to the uh, president of the university, Nathan Pusey at that time. And one thing led to another and Richard uh, Ramdas was fired. Tim was, uh, was let go uh, because he, uh, he stopped showing up for classes basically. So, okay. so technically at one, at one point he just violated his contract because he didn't he just stopped showing up to teach, really. <laughs> so that was, uh, Ralph Metzer, myself, and, and George Litwin, uh, and a couple of other, a number of other graduate students who I said were a little bit more on the periphery. Yeah. And, uh, and we had a difficult time also because the, the faculty in the uh, Department of Social Relations, which included psychology and sociology, but particularly psychology, uh, there was a real vendetta to clean house. Yeah, and, and all of that's part of public history. And Andrew Weil plays a significant role in in that drama also. Uh, but I was able to remain to finish my PhD. First of all, because I had a uh, pending offer for Abe Maslow that you mentioned in your intro, and secondly, because one of the uh, really influential tenured faculty in the psychology department there, or in the social psychology department. Uh, went to bat for me, oddly enough, because he had known my father uh, uh, my, and my father's work in Germany as a psychologist. Uh, when my family, including myself, escaped the, the Nazis in 1939 and arrived in the U.S. in 39, he had actually been in communication with my father around some early psychological work my father was doing in the field of synesthesia, multi-sensory synesthesia. Okay. He was very interested in that and read, read German. So when I first came as a graduate student to Harvard in the fall of 1960, I sought him out and, and spent an hour with him and we chatted. And so he was an ally. So he, given his position and his influence there, he was able to intercede. And basically I was given the time and the runway to finish my degree Good. and go out yeah. and take my first teaching job with, with with Abe, you know. Okay, wow. Um, so, you know, after, so uh, Timothy's let go, Tim's let go, and Ram Dass 
is fired. And then they sort of kind of have these different approaches. I, I think they're pretty stark differences, um, but maybe not. I'd love to ask you, you know, what are your thoughts on Timothy Leary's approach to sort of teaching on consciousness and, and then compared to Ram Dass's approaches to, to teaching on consciousness? Well, that took some years to evolve. Immediately after uh, Tim was fired and, and the program was shut down, uh, and I participated in that part-time, we formed a nonprofit organization called IFIF, the International Federation for Internal Freedom. Uh, we rented a, a small office suite in a, in a, uh, in a uh, building in, in Harvard Square, and we were cranking out pamphlets and, and, and doing more, more uh, reaching out and, and writing and so on. Uh, it's an interesting acronym, the IFIF, the International yeah. Federation. <laughs> a lot of it was tongue in cheek, and then the Psychedelic Review was flowering at that point. So I, you know, I was continue to engage in that while I was trying, much more low key, obviously, uh, in order to finish my degree. Then, uh, what happened next was a uh, one of our colleagues, uh, a woman in New York. Uh, and this is all public history, so I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, violating any confidentiality here. Is a member of the uh, Hitchcock family, which was a wealthy. Uh, family, uh, one of the very wealthy uh, families in America. Uh, she had taken uh, psilocybin a number of times in LSD with, with uh, Tim and uh, Richard. And she and her brothers owned a, an estate in upstate New York, a 3,000 acre estate called the Diedrich Estate, which was created by a man who brought the gas lamp to New York City and whenever that was in the early 1800s. So he was a multimillionaire and he built this incredible mansion or, or a number of mansions on this very large property. And we were invited uh, by Peggy and her brother to occupy a big mansion there. And so we moved everything there. Now I didn't move there. I, I, can, I needed to stay in Cambridge to finish my degree. I eventually did move there uh, after, uh, in, during my first year, I started teaching at Brandeis and then I actually gave up my position, uh, you know, uh, to, I dropped out, so to speak, in order to join these guys uh, in Millbrook, you know, in Millbrook, New York, mm -hmm. uh, at, in the Diederich estate. And that's a whole set of stories relating to that. So it was at that time, I'm coming back to your question, it was over time, particularly uh, the initial visits to India. So uh, Tim and Dick went to India. I forgot if Tim went first and then Richard went. I think Tim went first uh, and then Richard went. And of course, his experiences with his guru there, Neem Karoli Baba. And there was a whole set of circumstances then that developed uh, for Richard Ramdas, where he began, became a student of uh, the Vedas and of Buddhism and, and other spiritual paths. And so he embraced and uh, completely embraced over a series of years, uh, which eventually was an aspect of their splitting up. There were other variables, of course, going on there, including the raid on Melbrook by G. Gordon Liddy, who was Nixon's appointee, uh, who headed the, I think, uh, you know, a drug reinforcement agency. He, he actually came to Nixon's attention by the midnight raid or early 2 a.m. raid on Millbrook. Yeah. Uh, and he and Tim, and he was part of the plumbers. He was part of the Watergate. <laughs> so it was a really interesting <coughs> connection between Watergate and Millbrook. A lot of the stuff is not, is really not well, well known, you know, how in the 60s, how all these things were connected. Yeah. So it was at that time then that coming back from India that, then Richard Ramdas, it, it, they began to separate. Uh, and, the, and then Milbrook eventually disbanded. Uh, and they, they went their separate ways. So Tim really never really embraced, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a spiritual path. Okay. Uh, yeah. He didn't have that kind of interest or discipline. Uh, Tim really chafed against any authority of any type. 
So yeah. it wasn't just like the Nixon administration and that whole scene. Tim had a history of, of, of a kind of rebellious anti-authority orientation. Goes right. back, yes. Read his autobiography. It goes back, or and biographies of him, going back to uh, when he was at West Point, for example, where he violated the honor code, uh, either, uh, either sneaking a woman into his dorm room or alcohol, whatever it was, and he was put on the silent treatment for a year. In other words, none of the cadets were allowed to speak with him, uh, or he was allowed to speak with any of the cadets. He was essentially, uh, you know, held to an oath of silence and, 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 and ex, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? He was, uh, he was, <clears throat> he was pushed out of the, of the. Yeah, excommunicated. Excommunicated, so thank you. <laughs> As a good Catholic, that actually makes sense for Tim. So until the last day, the last hour of the last day of his sentence, when he resigned his appointment. Oh, wow. Okay. So he stayed there for a whole year under these daunting limitations. And then, you know, as a kind of screw you attitude, he right. resigned his, uh, his commission the last day. Wow. Uh, to show him he could, he could handle whatever they were handing out. Uh, you know, and go, you know, look at Tim's history, whether again, with, the, with, you know, later on with the 60s, all this stuff is happening with, you know, John Lennon and Yoko and, and uh, a variety of people in the Chicago Six and on and on. And Tim got very involved in social process and the civil rights movement very deep. We all did to some extent. Yeah. Uh, he got really involved, uh, particularly uh, uh, at that time. And, and uh, Ram Dass had had a different orientation again. Yeah, I mean, even even when, when Tim was on the lam, he got busted out of out of prison in in California by the Weathermen. At that time, he ended up in in Algeria, uh, living with Eldridge Cleaver, who was one of the black founders of the Black Panther movement, and and the, the, the Algerian government, which was a socialist, very left wing, almost communist socialist government was at loggerheads with the US government and were looking to score propaganda points. So they basically, uh, when Tim landed there, he was given refuge by the Algerian government, but he was forced to be uh, part of Eldridge Cleaver's coterie, if you will. So Tim wrote a, a wonderful little book called Confessions of a Hope Fiend. Confessions of a Hope Fiend, a small little book about his experiences in Algeria, living with Eldridge Cleaver, where at one point he called him half humorously his parole officer. So, so Cleaver had to had a play by the rules the Algerian government was laying down, and right. none of them could deal with a rascal like Tim, who was, <laughs> you know, whether it was name your authority, left, right, or center. If it was an authority, Tim. It wasn't happening. Yeah. Right. <laughs> wasn't happening. Wow. Yeah. So this is just, this is so fun to me. I can't stop smiling through so, this. We get well, to Tim, Tim was a black Irishman. Uh, and and, and the, the black Irish are noted for their rebelliousness, their poetry, yes. their ingenuity. Um, their my humor, dad is, my know. dad is a black Irish. Right. So, you know. <laughs> we you got know, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's obviously this resurgence, people are calling it a renaissance in psychedelic research that's, that's happening right now. Um, you know, I'd argue that it's actually been happening for about 20 years, <laughs> but right now it's really, you know, it's amping up. A lot of people are, um, you know, new to the scene. Some folks like MAPS and, and other groups have been around for a while, you know, they're trying to get MDMA um, into phase three trials. We're seeing um, pharmaceutical companies pop on the scene to create pharmaceuticals from psychedelics, particularly psilocybin. And you still have a lot of great university and academia work that's happening. And 
you know, from your perspective, having been involved in the, the beginning of this, what lessons can we take into this resurgence of psychedelic research? I think there are a number of things. Uh, the dilemmas that we faced and created back in the 60s uh, were ones of, of uh, essentially of, of uh, institutional control and fear. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think that over the years, uh, people, di different people, including Rick Doblin and others, have pointed back to probably some of the errors that, that we made or that were ma unavoidably because we were pioneers. We, we, right. we were just kind of making it up as we were going. You know, we were so influenced by these powerful experiences. We knew we had, we had access to deeply transformational tools. Mm -hmm. And there was early work going on. After all, this, this was birthed out of Sandoz. It, it was invented as to be potentially used as a uh, psilocybin and LSD to be used as therapeutic agents. So and all of that, as we all know, got shut down. Okay? Right. Uh, by the way, Rick Doblin, who you mentioned, was a graduate student at that time, I think at, at BU. Uh, Boston University and, and actually did a research paper, maybe for his thesis, on the work that we were doing uh, with the prison project. So he actually did an article on that a couple of years later. Uh, and Ralph and I also wrote a little article on, on the impact of the recidivism rate. So he had early exposure and he could see early on as a graduate student how uh, things were unfolding. And then to his credit, I believe he, you know, he, he worked for about 30 years uh, to yeah. legitimize uh, these agents uh, under the rubric of MAPS. Uh, and they are very close to having approval, uh, I believe maybe a year away or less for MDMA. Yeah, they're, they're doing another raise right now, I think uh, just to finish up the yeah. last bit of trials. So it seems- uh, I know a number of people that, uh, particularly here in Boulder, uh, which is one of their research centers, research sites. So uh, I think the issue that we faced then was, it was so new, it was so different. It was, I mean, imagine doing this kind of work in, in the bastion of American rationality, a la Harvard University, right? Where the mind is king. Mm -hmm. but here, here we're working with substances that transcend rational cognitive conceptual reality as it's formed and understood in academia. Sure. It's not a very good fit, at least at that time, okay? Right. Uh, also then the, you know, Tim's tendencies, which I described earlier, uh, his anti-authoritarian tendencies, getting caught up in different protest movements, uh, all of that created a, a uh, an environment where it was, was very, very uh, inevitable. It was inevitable that it would be sh the work would be shut down. So I think the issue today is different. What concerns me more today is how quickly we are moving potentially to commercialization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a risk there as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, there are some nuances there that have to be looked at in terms of, for example, decriminalization for example, which uh, legislation passed or a referendum passed in Denver last year, I believe. So yep. decriminalizing the personal use of psilocybin is very different than commercializing and licensing the use of it in a, in a, uh, as a pharmaceutical agent. Right. One of the things that concerns me is going forward, will the drive towards commercialization uh, tend to feed back into uh, what may be a growing emergence of decriminalization and recriminalize the non-medical use, okay? That's a potential issue. Yeah, I hear, I hear what you're saying there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would hope that you're right. When we have people making, or companies making millions and billions, what usually will be billions if it's a, a pharmaceutical and then you have people sitting in prison 
um, for nonviolent crimes, you know, because they, they happen to have these substances on them or we're using them. And it's, it's kind of the same thing that we're dealing with now with cannabis. You know, for, for reference of when we're recording this, everyone, we're three months into a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. Cannabis is deemed essential business and our work with Realm of Caring, like my founding Realm of Caring and the work that we do there is, is cannabinoid related. It's all cannabis related. And, um, and in fact, my son transitioned from being on hospice to being healthy, 17 years old now, yet there are people, and so we do research and we educate doctors and, and people who are using cannabis, yet we've you know, got so many people in, in prison on drug charges. Yes. And it just it makes absolutely no sense. So we have to address the inequities there, certainly. Yes. Well, here's another aspect of commercialization that gives me pause. Uh, and I'm not against commercialization or, or the uh, legitimizing of this for medical use. I think that's really important. But I, there's some caveats there we have to pay attention yeah, to. Yeah, it's like both and. Yeah. You know, it's instead of either or. <laughs> well, for example, Heather, like last year I became aware of, uh, of uh, clinics now are setting up to use ketamine, which is, is uh, legal, okay? And there are clinics that, for example, administer ketamine sublingually. A client comes in, they're, they're, they do an initial interview, they're given a subliminal uh, experience of maybe two or three hours, whatever it is, and get in that setting, and they're sent home with a, you know, with a, uh, a prescription for ketamine, take on their own, okay? So, and, and, and these are cash cows, these clinics are potential cash cows. And they're- Yeah, they're, I didn't know they were actually able to go home and take it. I thought that they had to come back to the clinical- I don't know, I may be wrong there. Administration, but yeah. okay. So, uh, so I've also, uh, I heard, for example, again, I can't verify these. I'm maybe just repeating rumors, but uh, that, there are a group of researchers studying, for example, ketamine or other substances that, that want to remove the psychedelic aspect of that. Uh, they consider that to be a side effect. Yes, in Ibogaine, um, that was one area that I heard with, with Ibogaine, they're trying to take out the um, you know, psychedelic effect, right. just use the, right. you would personally, you'd think, what's the point or uh, well, I mean, I, that should happen? I, I have a built-in historical and contemporary sure. bias around this. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the so-called psychedelic component, you know, the mind expanding, the, you know, the, the, uh, the psychic exploration is a critical element in healing. Mm. Uh, whether it's, it's you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, you know, healing, uh, being able to heal one's fear of, di of death and dying. Uh, yeah, all kinds it of very well could be, yeah. Could use. The psychological components are, are critical to those in my, in my estimation. Right, very well could be. I think that was, that's why trials need to happen where you can discover if that, that's indeed needed. But I definitely see where you're, where you're going there for sure. So I'm wondering, um, yeah, well, I know what you're up to now and, and some of your passion areas. I'd love for you to tell our, our guests about that because I find you absolutely fascinating. What are, what's your, what are you up to nowadays? What's taking your time? Well, my focus uh, for the last 15 years or so, or actually much longer, my, I, you know, when, once I I dropped in and out of academia a couple of times after Brandeis. I, I taught and was an administrator at, at UMass Boston. I also taught in, uh, earlier on for a while at Boston College. But I left academia finally, and I, I got into business consulting and then management consulting and coaching. Uh, and so I brought my skills as a psychologist and as a businessman, and including elements of my psychedelic experiences, and my life experiences, been brought to bear over many years in this field of, of coaching. And about 15 years ago, I came to a, an epiphany 
about the importance of human values being a very, a, a very critical element for people's sense of purpose and meaning. Uh, and also the success of individuals and organizations knowing their values and living their values, embodying their values. So I began to research this area, uh, what elements were in the field of psychology and other areas. And one thing led to another and I, I experimented and finally stumbled across a methodology and a, a theoretical model. Uh, the former partner and I then licensed and adopted and that led to further iterations with a current uh, colleague who has been my now colleague for the last 12 or 13 years in, in Australia uh, to move this study of human values forward. Uh, so I've been working with, uh, with a methodology, again, that assesses values and also is a process of, of clarifying, of concretizing values in a coaching engagement for individuals and groups and organizations. Identifying, yeah. measuring empirically the values they have and then providing methodologies for allowing them to integrate their values into all kinds of activities that they're doing that include all kinds of aspects of business or personal life or personal planning or financial planning or there are a range of applications. So I continue to be involved in in the application of that model with clients and also in research and development, opening up different areas. So one of the things to come full circle here that interests me now is I'm kind of revisiting uh, the current psychedelic scene, having had this history yes. for so many years now, going back to 1960, right? So it's a long time. So uh, I feel I have perhaps some insight, something to offer here in this current generation of people that are working with this. I would like to explore how we could utilize the values assessment in an empirical research context to see, uh, to measure uh, using this model and this, this methodology uh, before and after measures on the shift in worldviews and, and values in people that go yeah. through psychedelic experiences. I think I think this is essential because, you know, um, I've led businesses for a long time. Um, prior to my nonprofit work, it was you know in in restaurants and managed you know a lot of a lot of restaurants, and so I've I've worked with a lot of people uh, over the years. I mean, probably thousands in my decade in the restaurant business, fast food. So a lot there and, you know, since then have, have worked with a, a lot of staff and just myself personally, why I went through the values mentoring for, for myself was I felt like I had just kind of not been making real conscious decisions about what I wanted to do in life. Like opportunities would come, I would take it and 10 years later, I'm like, what is, you know, how did I get here? And all wonderful, but it was like, I really wanted to be very, very conscious. I wanted to discover what my values are. I'll give you a, 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 a very practical example. So one of my values that I learned from taking the, the AVI, the values inventory with Gunther was um, pioneerism and progress, number one value. So now that we've, and, and my second highest value, transcendence, hence my work in, in this space. And so if, if my life can align with that, and if I can look to that and before I make decisions, before I jump off the cliff, which is usually what I do. So it's like jumping off the cliff, building the plane while I'm <laughs> falling, you know, finally I, you know, get, get lift off there. If I can just slow down a sec, look at my values and make decisions based off of that. And I tell you, I've, I've done that since last year when we started our, our coaching and it is such a huge difference. And as related to psychedelics, I know pre and post my psychedelic experience that I used to, um, in a very controlled way to try and heal from trauma with trying to keep my son alive for a decade. You know, my values changed big time. I was a different person before than who I was after. And so I, I really want to look at this because I think if we can if, our, if we can change our values, if we can, you know, 
be kind of want to be too idealistic here, but like be better people, then we're going to show up better in our families, in our communities. We're going to care about our planet. You know, we're doing so much damage to our planet. And I didn't really think about those things prior. I just really didn't, embarrassingly. I wasn't thinking about the planet. <laughs> and that is a major issue. And, and this is, you know, something I know for sure that we need to prove through research that values change. So we have to get this done, I feel like. Yeah. Well, there's a piece of it that's really important. Uh, uh, in, in my work, we distinguish between what we call worldviews and values. Worldviews are the assumptions and beliefs. They're the filters through which we look at life. Like right now, as I'm speaking to you, I'm looking through reading glasses, right? And, and they, so I, after a few seconds of having of putting these on, I'm no longer aware I have them on. So I'm looking at, at so-called reality through the lens of, of, uh, of like a 2.0 diopter, which is a measure of, of magnification, right? Or distortion. So I'm looking through a distortion lens. It's a, it's a useful distortion because it helps me read better. Yes. But all of us are living within worldviews. And they're unquestioned assumptions and beliefs we have about life, about reality, about money, about sex, about li life and death, about relationships, about races. I mean, these built-in assumptions uh, and beliefs, uh, these can are and these are revisited in the course of psychedelic sessions. Mm -hmm. We actually experience often the reality of the filters that that yeah. are the you know the the what Huxley called the doors of perception, right? The phrase for that they're temporarily suspended. Mm -hmm. Step out of in a moment of freedom out of the worldviews, out of these assumptions, unconscious assumptions, and we see reality in a way like, in a childlike way, okay, before it resets, okay? Right. Uh, and the values are part of that. The values are populated, the worldviews are populated by values. Basically, they give rise to a range of values and there are 128 values within this model. So it strikes me, for example, that in any therapeutic application of psychedelics, uh, for example, let's, let's take, uh, let's say trauma work. Okay, post-traumatic trauma work. It's essential that there be a context for, for the psychedelic session in the trauma work before, during, and after, okay? The psychedelics are one tool that are used within, in my, this is my belief and my assumption, within a context of personal change and transformation. Yes. So I think the values work could play a role in that not only in a prior, not only from an experimental research standpoint of seeing what empirical shifts there are in values that go beyond a, people's personal reports. Personal reports are essential at an anecdotal level, but I think we need to go beyond that. Yeah. So, so having a relatively valid uh, instrument, if you will, or, or a methodology. Yeah, measure. Validated measure, yeah. Measure. I think would be interesting to put that in the mix to see what would be the shift between uh, a uh, prior to and then post a uh, MDMA or psilocybin or whatever yeah. session. And then I believe in, in, in a therapeutic application, the values work could be utilized in a therapeutic context, for example, to uh, yeah, this help is support good. people through the, through the process. And this I is really good, yeah. Because I, I know. We can't figure that out. So call yeah, us. <laughs> One watching who's like, yeah, let's get that done. <laughs> we'll help. <laughs> as part of my, you know, re-education, so to speak, in psychedelics, currently, as I'm kind of revisiting this space now, uh, in it, uh, I can see where uh, the, 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 the real need, which we saw back in the 60s, the real need to have some vibrant and solid methodologies that can help people in the so-called integration process. Okay. Yes. So that's interesting. So, you know, you have kind of reintroduced yourself to psychedelics in an effort, I think, um, I've heard you refer to as like preparing for your death, and not in a morbid way. Um, 
at all. Like, but it's something that you're revisiting. You brought it up. So I, I would love to talk about that. Um, you've been re-experimenting with psychedelics to, um, to, to die well. Uh, yeah. Tell me about that. And I know Ron Doss has a lot of teaching on, on death and dying. I, I recently, um, and even had a foundation, uh, or maybe still that foundation still exists ar uh, around that. Um, and his in a new uh, movie about him called Becoming Nobody that's on YouTube. I think you have to pay for it, but it's worth every penny for those of you that are interested. It's a, a documentary, but a movie about Ram Dass. And so they, he talks a lot about, um, yeah, death and dying. I'd love to hear your take on this. Well, in, in terms of Ram Dass, you know, this, he spent a lot of years exploring the space of death and dying uh, in, in, the er, in his early stages as, as Ram Dass, basically. Uh, you know, bringing some of the Vedic and Buddhist wisdom to that, uh, and as well as his own, inspired by psychedelics. Uh, I actually had a, uh, an encounter with him, I mean that in a positive sense, many years ago in my second wife, who was dying of cancer, uh, and we were in San Diego because we were commuting across the border to Tijuana for experimental clinics because Western medicine had pretty much given up on her. And I heard that he was in town giving a talk. So I reached out to him, to the organizer, and then got in touch with him. And we connected and he came over and he spent an hour or so with, with uh, my former wife who was passing away at that time, doing his work with her. So I was so grateful to that. He was so loving and kind that way. Now, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm 83 going on 84. Uh, uh, it's inevitable that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, entertaining my own mortality, <coughs> not in any pathological or morbid way. It's just I, I want to die as consciously as I can. Mm. Uh, you know, Huxley, for example, when he died, he died on his deathbed. His wife Laura gave him some LSD. I don't think that's really necessary uh, or, or even necessarily desirable. I've spent a lot of years, basically since the mid 1960s, uh, propelled through my early psychedelic experiences uh, to uh, discover or ex and explore a variety of spiritual paths, including Taoism and Buddhism and Vedic practices and and, and a variety of, uh, of healing methodologies relating to uh, oriental medicine and philosophy. So a lot of these teachings are part of, my, of the fabric of my being at this point. And so I, I want to prepare for my own death whenever that'll be, and none of us know when that is, but I would like to be able to die consciously and, and uh, and freely, basically, and, and surrender to, uh, to a life, the end of a life pretty well lived, actually. I, I, I would say so. so. I would definitely uh, say so. So that, that is my aim. And so I have been re-exploring psychedelics in the last couple of years. Uh, a couple of uh, MDMA sessions, a couple of uh, psilocybin sessions, to re-explore that theme in the context of the spiritual work I've done a variety of practices, revisiting some of the deeper insights of, of the psychedelics, and, and just kind of finding my way through, through this uh, to the level of acceptance, not resignation, but, you know, just really impartial acceptance of, uh, of my mortality. You know, and yeah. I don't know what else I could say about that. I could write um, more about that, but there's no need to. Uh, Ram, um, Ram Das had said in our Western culture, although death has come out of the closet, it is openly, it still is not openly experienced or discussed. Allowing dying to be so in, intensely present enriches both the preciousness of each moment and our detachment from it. And I thought that was a really beautiful quote. I think about death and dying a lot, not in a, in a morbid way, but just having 
cared for a son who is not expected to live into adulthood. And a lot of my circle, you know, parents who are taking care of very sick kids and have experienced just a lot of um, mourning and loss and death and, and dying. And so it's something that I think we need to get in touch with as a Western culture and, and learn from these other cultures, the, the Mayan culture in regards to um, death and dying and mourning um, is, it's so beautiful um, compared to us when it's like, you know, be strong, which equates don't cry. <laughs> and we just, it's just a bizarre sort of um, experience that we have here in Western culture. So I think that's really beautiful that you are preparing for that. And I think that we're never too young to prepare for that. We don't know when that's happen and our ability to mourn and grieve um, gives us the ability now to praise life and so I think the sooner that we can get you know in touch with this I think it's really um, critical and so I'm glad we got to talk about that and um, well just to give you a little insight there following Ram Dass's comments I grew up in a time where both birth and death were out of sight for example, my children, who are, you know, close to 60, 60 in their 60s, uh, they were born in a hospital in, in Boston. And I was, I remember standing behind the plate glass window with a nurse coming out with both my son and daughter in swaddling clothes, watching them through the mirror, not even able to hold them, actually. Mm. Yeah. So that was in the early 60s when that was the norm, right? Yes. Now, now we've made a lot of progress in, since then where fathers can be in the delivery room, right? But the deaf part uh, has not yet been as, as well addressed. I mean, certainly the hospice yeah. movement has been a very critical aspect of that, in a positive yes. way. But the, the fuller realization of, of, the, of the interconnection of life and death, for example, and uh, how this gets played out in consciousness, there's still a lot of work to do there. And, and this is where, again, uh, the psychedelics can be very helpful, particularly the application for helping people who are facing death uh, yeah. to, to regain a sense of confidence and equanimity and, and, and uh, surrender. The word surrender actually means to render up, to soar, S-U-R, render, to render up you know, to give to the universe or God or Buddha nature, whatever words you want to use. Yeah. So I think there's really interesting work that can be done there at this time. And again, I, I have the, uh, the, the privilege and the, the good luck of, of, of having, still being healthy and vital at the age of 83 and a half uh, and being able to look back and glean experiences from the early 60s and all the successive work that I've done, spiritual work, professional work, and so on. And it's, I don't know if it's in the cards or not, if, uh, but there may be a, a way at this point, point that, uh, including the, this kind of webinar we're doing here, yeah. or interview where I can come back in. And I would like to do it in a way that reflects my uh, skill set, both in the psychedelics and in, in human values. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can, um, I'll say that I think it's very welcome. So we'll have to, we will have to figure that out for sure. <laughs> um, any closing thoughts that you might have? Uh, yeah, I just want to say I, I'm really delighted by this renaissance uh, and the work, and knowing you and the work you're doing, the work you've done with Realm of Caring, how heartful and how grounded, how important that work is in the Canada space. And now what you're leaning into and more than leaning into are birthing in this psychedelic space. The importance of grounded research, uh, of helping educate uh, people. Uh, there, there are a lot of other people like Pollen's book and many things that are in this space now. And, uh, and again, I have some concerns. I see elements pending around over, over commercialization, control, uh, <clears throat> Any number of things, for example, uh, including even, you know, going back to uh, 
the early days of, of possible government control mm -hmm. over, you know, for propagandistic or other crowd control purposes. So that, that hasn't left the scene. That, that's in the wings, okay? Yeah. So, you know, I, I just think we need to be really mindful, careful, and uh, conscious of what roles we're playing, what's motivating us to enter the space and to play, yeah. uh, play a role in it. Okay? I'm yeah. not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not at all against the, the, the appropriate certification and the legitimizing and medical approval, but it needs to be done with heart. It needs mm. to be done with intelligence. It cannot be driven only by the profit motive. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for saying that. Um, where can our um, viewers find you? Uh, do you have a website or what's your social handle? How do we, how do uh, we? Find yeah, best thing is uh, probably my, uh, my website, which is uh, www.valuementors.com. Okay, great. Uh, there's uh, my, uh, my email is on that site. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I have a I have a Facebook page, a personal face Facebook page. So. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. Um, well, I I have been looking forward to this. Uh, you did not fail me. This is just so exciting. Thank you so much for your time. I know how valuable it is. Um, it's the it's our most precious resource, and it's the only thing we are not getting back. So when people spend time with me. I, you know, I appreciate that so much. So thanks everyone for watching um, and for participating and for joining us today from home. Um, please check out Unlimited Sciences on all of our socials. We're on all the everything, Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter and LinkedIn. You can find us by just searching Unlimited Sciences. Um, and if you want to help support this work, um, please, please consider donating to Unlimited Sciences. Um, everyone, please um, stay safe um, and stay well. And thank you so much for, for watching. Take care. Thank you, others. God Bye. bless. Take good care. God bless.